Merci d'être venu pour le séminaire cet après-midi. Notre invité aujourd'hui, c'est Vincent, euh, Vincent U. Je ne sais pas je, si j'ai bien dit ton nom, excuse-moi. Parfait. <rire> euh, et je vais tout de suite laisser la parole à Thibault hein, pour introduire notre speaker. Merci, Timia. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Alors aujourd'hui, on a le plaisir d'accueillir virtuellement Vincent, qui se trouve de l'autre côté de l'Atlantique, au Southwest Research Institute de San Antonio, au Texas, où il poursuit ses recherches depuis, depuis fin 2015, si je ne dis pas de bêtises. Il a été en thèse au, dans nos murs, dans l'équipe ASP. Il avait développé un modèle photochimique de dimension dépendant du temps pour les planètes géantes du système solaire. Et suite à sa thèse, il est donc parti au SWERI pour rejoindre l'équipe qui est en charge de l'instrument UVS, le spectrographe UV de la mission Juno, qui est arrivé en orbite autour de Jupiter peu de temps après. Et il est devenu l'un des, euh, des principaux euh, scientifiques euh, sur cet instrument et il va nous présenter euh, les résultats récents de cet instrument. C'est à toi. OK, merci. Uh, so I think I will present the presentation in English if no one... Um, if everybody is okay with that. So I'm going to take you today on a journey to explore the Jovian magnetosphere. Um, so Jupiter, just as a background, has uh, the strongest magnetic field of all the planets in the solar system, which, which generates this giant, giant magnetosphere, which uh, stretches almost all the way to the orbit of Saturn in the anti-sun direction. Uh, in the sun direction, of course, it's compressed by the incoming solar wind. Uh, <clears throat> and so you see here uh, kind of a snapshot of the inner magnetosphere. Uh, so those field line actually stretches from the North Pole to the South Pole over here. Um, in the inner magnetosphere, you see the, the main here, the main four Galilean satellites, <clears throat> EO, Europa, Ganymede, Callisto. And EO has a very, very important role in the Jupiter system, well, actually the Jupiter's magnetosphere, because it is providing the magnetosphere with about uh, one ton of SO2 per second uh, due to its very active volcanoes, which are not bounded by the gravity of EO because EO has a very tiny gravity. So this escapes freely from the, the satellite um, and then gets um, ionized, dissociated, and uh, heated and, and brought to rotation, to co-rotation with the, the magnetosphere, with the magnetic field of the planet. Um, and so uh, this, in the end, leads to the formation of what we call the Io plasma torus, this, this uh, donut-shaped torus right here. <clears throat> and as you can see here, that it is inclined with respect to the orbital plane of all the Galilean satellites because the Jupiter's magnetosphere, magnetic field, is actually inclined with respect to the rotation axis, <clears throat> which, which create this wobbly um, plasma torus whose oscillating with the 10 hour period um, of the plan planetary uh, uh, magnetic rotation. So this uh, plasma is very important because, um, uh, well, it's actually the main source of plasma in the Jupiter system. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, the, if you take the peak plasma density in Jupiter system, it, it is about a thousand times more important than the peak plasma density in the Earth's magnetosphere. So it's a, it's a very important source of plasma. This plasma, as I said, gets uh, picked up by the rotating magnetosphere, magnetic field. Uh, it creates this torus. Uh, it, the torus also um, um, expand outward, which create this magneto disk, um, which, uh, as you can see, deform uh, the, the magnetic field line. Uh, it, uh, it differ from a pure uh, magnetic dipole in the outer magnetosphere because you have the, the magnetic contribution of the, uh, the magneto disk that kind of stretches out the, the magnetic field line. Um, okay, so that's, that's a kind of a brief um, introduction on the Jupiter's magnetosphere. In this presentation, uh, so I will yeah, talk a little bit more about the, the Jovian magnetosphere uh, dynamics and aurora. I'll talk uh, about the Juno mission and the instrument that was built at my institute here uh, called UVS. And then um, I will present one of the most recent papers that I led, which uh, concerned the exploration of the polar 
auroral region of uh, Jupiter, which I'm going to explain uh, what we're talking about. Okay, so there's still an uh, unresolved debate as to what mechanism control the magnetospheric dynamics at Jupiter. In other words, the question is how the plasma is exactly lost in the magnetosphere. One of the first models proposed that um, there is an internally driven magnetosphere. So um, this plot shows you a cross section. So uh, the equator of Jupiter is over here. Uh, the sun is uh, towards the left. Um, and what happened in this early model, um, you have the plasma that is in co-rotation with the magnetosphere, which formed this disk again. Uh, and when it rotates in the night side of, of the planet, which is here, uh, what you have is that you have centrifugal stretching of the magnetic disk in that tail regions, which allows a pinching of some plasmoid. So you have some tail driven magnetic reconnection uh, illustrated here, where you have the magnetic field line that intersect and reconnect, which allows some plasmoid to be ejected from the magnetosphere down the tail, which is represented here as the outward flow. And once you have this uh, tail driven reconnection, uh, following this, you have the inward flow that is uh, uh, bringing back some of the plasma uh, down towards the planet. So that was one of the early models, uh, also called the Vassilunia cycle. <clears throat> the other, uh, other um, mechanism for losing uh, the plasma in the magnetosphere is actually inspired from the solar wind driven reconnection on Earth called the Dungy cycle. Um, so they proposed a similar, um, a similar uh, cycle for Jupiter, uh, also called the Dungy cycle. And in that, um, in that um, cycle, actually, what happened is that you have the, the magnetic field carried by the solar wind, uh, also called the IMF, which reconnects with the, um, with the planetary magnetic field of Jupiter in the uh, day side magnetosphere. So in the, in the part of the magnetosphere are being compressed by the solar wind. Uh, this, once they reconnect, those are advected down the tail by the, by the flowing of the solar wind where they can eventually reconnect also in the tail. Uh, so that's another uh, method to lose plasma in the magnetosphere. Um, so to investigate more which processes is dominant, um, you know, although we know for a long time that Jupiter's magnetosphere is mostly internally or rotation driven, um, there's still considerable debate, as I said before, as to what is the importance of the solar wind driven uh, uh, mechanism on Jupiter. To better investigate that, studying aurora is very important, and I'm going to explain why. Just a brief recap on Jupiter's aurora. Aurora is, is actually a very universal process of every uh, magnetized planet that has an atmosphere. What's happening is that you have the charged particles that are trapped on magnetic field line, which are gyrating along the magnetic field line according to the Lorentz force. Uh, and they gyrate to one hemisphere where they reach their mirror points and they're kind of bounce back and they go from one hemisphere to the other. And sometimes due to some scattering process, they can actually, um, or acceleration process, they can actually precipitate in the atmosphere, which that then triggers the, uh, the aura. Jupiter being mostly hydrogen dominated, you can see here a vertical profile of uh, the main atmosphere compound in the upper atmosphere of Jupiter. So it's mostly hydrogen, helium, um, and uh, uh, H2. Uh, you can calculate where those um, aurora occur. Uh, so, for instance, this is uh, the volume emission rate in the UV and in the infrared, depending on what uh, energy of precipitating particle you consider. For um, electrons on the order of 100 keV, the, the altitude of the emission is, is around 400 kilometers above the one bar level on Jupiter. All right, so uh, Hubble has been an incredible tool and it still is an incredible tool to monitor Jupiter's aurora. What I'm showing here uh, is a, a view of the northern uh, aurora on Jupiter here on the left, um, as observed by Hubble. It's actually a video, so I'm gonna play it. 
Uh, and on the right, it's kind of uh, the reprojection of those aurora uh, as you could see them if you would see them like from the North Pole uh, looking down. So this is the geographical pole right here. Um, <clears throat> and you can see on this image, on this video, that uh, the aurora is, is extremely complex, extremely active. Uh, there's regions that are kind of steady, uh, constant, and other regions that are really uh, flickering and, and very pulsating. OK, um, and so to better understand, as I, as I was saying before, the, the, uh, you know, the magnetospheric dynamics, you can map each of those oral regions to a region in the magnetosphere. Uh, so how you do that? Uh, using a magnetic field model, which actually Juno you know, uh, uh, kind of updated the magnetic, magnetic model of Jupiter, you can follow the magnetic field line to any given oral region up to their, their origin in the magneto disk. Uh, and so the closer those overall emission will be from the magnetic pole, which again is offset from the geographic pole by about a tenth of uh, around 10 degree, more or less. Um, the closer you are from the magnetic pole, the further out you're going to map in the magnetosphere. The, so the closer you are from the magnetic pole, again, the further out you're going to map in the magnetosphere. So that's very important. Um, and so uh, I can show actually this um, figure that illustrate all the sub aurora region on Jupiter that have been um, uh, cataloged and, and referenced uh, in the past. And I'm going to go as a, as a recap through some of the most uh, important one. Uh, let's start from the most equator word, aurora, which means that they map closer to the, what well, they map to the inner magnetosphere. Uh, the first one I should mention is the, uh, the overall footprint of the satellite. Um, so for instance, this one uh, represents the satellite footprint of EO, uh, char characterized, uh, characterized by one bright spot and the tail that you see here, uh, which is due to the interaction of the rotating magneto disk with the, the, the satellite, which generate its own kind of aurora. The second one is the um, main aurora, which is uh, shown here, which is this kind of steady emission, um, kind of ring-shaped uh, or a peanut, a peanut shaped aura like here. Um, that is due, that is mapping to, uh, so a little bit further out from the Galilean satellite, mapping to uh, 20 to 60 RJ, um, but its origin is still debated. Uh, the classical picture is that uh, as, as you have the rotating plasma that diffuses out in the magnetosphere, there's a point where they can actually be coupled with the planet. Um, and so it makes like field aligned currents like this one, which creates this steady constant overall emission, which also we call the main oval because it kind of looked like a, an oval. Um, and the last one, which is uh, the one that's gonna be the main, the, the, sub, like the subject of this talk, which is called the polar aurora, which is everything that is inside this, uh, this kind of uh, oval shaped aurora right here. Uh, and so that's the most um, surprising and, and mysterious one because most of the planet that have a, a magnetosphere, they have a kind of a main aurora uh, type of emission, but they don't have anything inside this main so they don't have any polar aurora, basically. Um, and this is due to the fact that in most of those planets, the polar aurora is actually the, the region where the magnetic field line is connected to the, uh, to the uh, IMF, to the uh, uh, interplanetary, interplanetary magnetic field. So this region is called uh, open. It's the open field line region it's mo in most planets. But on Jupiter, the difference is that we have a lot of overall emission in that region, which is, uh, which is very uh, surprising. So that's one of the, the specifics of Jupiter. Um, and as I said, it, although it's, it has been extensively observed, it is still poorly understood. Uh, so since it's gonna be the, the, the subject of this talk, uh, I, may, I should mention the different sub-regions within this polar oral region. The first one is called the Swirl region. Uh, on this plot is shown here as a, as a red patch of emission. Of course, it's just a scheme right here. Um, and uh, as I said before, it's been 
it's been um, interpreted as being the open flux region, the, the region open to the uh, outside magnetic field. Uh, and mostly because people uh, have been observed it in the infrared and they have been looking at the uh, kind of the ionospheric wind, um, which tells you if this regions rotate with the magnetic field or if it's independent, meaning that it would be connecting, it would be connected to the uh, uh, IMF. And so in that, in that particular region, uh, people have measured the Doppler shift of the H3 plus emission in the ionosphere, and they show that this region is actually stagnant, um, which means that it should be uh, connecting to the, uh, it should correspond to the open flux region. But this is not uh, totally, um, uh, it's still debated. There's this alternative uh, 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 hypothesis. The other one is the um, UV dark polar region, which is this region here. Uh, and if I flip uh, the aurora, uh, the sun coming this way, uh, this is one of the HST images that show that this, this region is always kind of dark. Uh, it displays a crescent of low UV brightness that contracts and expands as Jupiter rotates. Um, and if, uh, well, people have been trying to interpret this region here by trying to understand where in the magnetosphere this region is, uh, is mapping to. Some people think it's mapping to the, um, to the, the flux tube, so the, the magnetic field line that connect to the region that have been emptied out from plasmoid, you know, once being ejected, as I said before. Uh, other people think it maps to the uh, dome sector right here, uh, where things are co-rotating and therefore not emitting any, any emission, co-rotating with the planet. Uh, and last but not least, the active region, which uh, uh, display always UV flare, very bright spots uh, and arc-like features. Uh, which some people think it's, it's mapping to the polar cusp on, on Jupiter. Okay, so the exploration of Jupiter. Um, so we've done a lot of flybys before, um, before actually orbiters, uh, you know, just an, as an exploration um, mission. So from uh, in the 70s, from the pioneers up to the latest, latest flyby, which was New Horizon in 2008, if I'm, if I'm correct. Uh, in the meantime, we had Galileo, which was an incredible mission uh, that really explored the inner part of Jupiter's magnetosphere. Juno is the second orbiter around Jupiter. And in preparation, uh, well, I should also mention that Juno, although the tick stops in 2021, uh, which was supposed to be the end of the nominal mission, and it is, uh, we've been extended up to 2025. And then we have Europa and JUICE, which are in preparation. Some of you actually work on that mission, so I'm, I'm not going to explain too much about it. Uh, but it should orbit the Jupiter system in uh, near the year 2030. Just a um, Juno mission in a nutshell. This is a new frontier a NASA mission, meaning that the, the budget of that mission is about $1 billion. The PI is Scott Bolton, working also at the Southwest Research Institute. It is the first solar-powered mission to Jupiter. It carries eight science instruments. It was launched in 2011, uh, and it took five years to get to Jupiter. Um, uh, and since then, we're on this very, uh, very unique orbit, uh, polar orbit, so going from pole to pole, and very elliptical, as you can see here. Um, Actually, our perigeove is about uh, four to 5,000 kilometer above the cloud top. Uh, and we designed this orbit so that we can avoid the, the very high radiation environment, which is uh, uh, especially bad near Io. So we try to avoid this region here. Um, and the beauty of that mission is that it is designed, it has a payload designed to study uh, the magnetosphere. I mean, one of the goal is actually to study the magnetosphere. That's all the goals. Um, and so the, the, the experiment is actually to fly through the flux tube that are so the, the magnetic field line that are carrying the particles that are precipitating then and triggering then the, uh, the aura. So we fly through those, those regions here. We measure with in-situ instruments on Juno, such as uh, electron and ion detector the particle population along those magnetic field line. And at the same time, when we're here, we can observe 
the entire aurora, and we can we can correlate what is the uh, electron and ion population and what is the corresponding aurora we can observe so that we can better understand the, the magnetosphere. The way we operate with UVS, which is a UV spectrograph operating between 68 and 210 nanometer, is that we build up aurora images by co-adding a swath of data. Because one of the things I, I forgot to say is that Juno is actually a spinning spacecraft and all the remote sensing instruments are looking uh, on the flank, which means that um, every rotation of the spacecraft, they have a view of uh, Jupiter. Uh, this image shows you, um, it's an animation that shows uh, how we actually operate. Uh, and this plot shows you, uh, I'm gonna stop this. This plot shows you one, uh, one swath of uh, data on Jupiter. And by co-adding multiple consecutive swaths, we can actually build up a global image of Jupiter's aurora. So that's kind of the overview on uh, Juno and uh, well, Juno UVS, at least, and the, the main goals of Juno. Now I'm going to talk about uh, one of the re recent study that I led, which is uh, which concerned one of the one of one interesting overall feature that we uh, detected. Uh, so we called it a concentric expanding aurora, although the initial name was, was auroral raindrop, and you'll understand why. Uh, so this shows kind of a, a, a stack images, a, a context images of Jupiter's northern aurora. You must be familiar with that by now. Um, and so in some sub-regions, when we look over consecutive spin over the same region, uh, we actually detected those kind of uh, interestingly uh, expanding aurora uh, within the polar aurora regions. Uh, and this is why we named them raindrop or initially because they kind of look like, uh, you know, a raindrop dropping on, on a surface of water. Um, so it's, uh, it's kind of uh, the, the non-official name of that feature. Um, so it's, it's characterized by uh, very faint UV brightness, as you can see here, the, the signal to noise is not, uh, is not the best, uh, but we, we have a clear detection. Uh, the brightness is lower than 140 kilo Rayleigh of UV emission, um, kilo Rayleigh, uh, well, 140 kilo Rayleigh of the H2 emission. Um, and, uh, and when you, knowing the spectral characteristic of this emission, um, they correspond to precipitating electron in the 80 to 160 kV range. So electron that has this energy that precipitate should create this kind of aurora. Um, and so just to give you an idea of the scale, they expand up to a thousand kilometer in radius, and then they vanish into a patch of diffuse aural emission, or they merge with a nearby aural structure. Uh, this is another example. Uh, of one of the of one of such emission, again located within the polar aurora region. Um, yeah, so over here, uh, and this one was recorded during PJ12, while the previous one was, uh, if I go back, it was PJ6, so the, the sixth uh, perigeove of Juno and and the twelfth perigeove of Juno. Uh, so okay, so next to further understand those those feature. What we can do is we can map where they came from in the magnetosphere. So here I'm showing th the three best events we recorded in the north. Um, so this plot shows you, if you can focus on my cursor, shows you the UV brightness, again, from uh, uh, H2 UV brightness. And on the right, you have what we call the color ratio which is uh, just a proxy for the depth of the auroral emission, just using the spectral feature, the spectral characteristic of that, of those auroral emission, um, you can actually derive what's the altitude they, those emission came from. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> when we take this, this emission, so again, this is a context image and the little square red box here uh, is where those features were, were detected. And if we map, in the magnetosphere where this came from. So this feature uh, actually mapped to this, uh, this region right here, which maps to uh, um, close to 100, uh, close to, yeah, 
120, well, around 100 RJ right here. Uh, so that's the distance from Jupiter center. Again, this is a, this is a, a view of the magnetosphere with the planet here, the sun uh, on the left, you have the bow shock right here. Of course, this is a model because uh, this, the, 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 re, the location of the bow shock changes considerably depending on the solar wind condition. So this, this event uh, maps to the down magnetosphere around um, 8 a.m. right here. This event uh, mapped to the, the tail magnetosphere, actually here at, uh, uh, at 1.7 local time, magnetospheric local time. And this one maps to the dusk magnetosphere around here. Uh, so we can measure how fast those, those uh, features extend. Um, and I measure that they, they map to uh, on the order of several uh, kilometer per second in the ionosphere. But if you and if if you think that it's uh, it was caused by uh, some plasma processes in the magnetosphere, they should expand in the magnetosphere up to uh, seven thousand kilometer per second. All right, so yeah, so that that was mapping here. So that's not the first time. Obviously, we detected transient events in the polar auroral region. Uh, actually, there's a quite a, a big, a large number of study uh, using Hubble in the past. Um, for instance, um, uh, Payet and Pranger in 2001 detected some bright spot, bright spot near noon magnetic local time, which they interpreted as being the cusp region, uh, the region where the magnetic field line curve and, and goes into the planet. Um, another study with Hubble, a very interesting study that shows that, um, so they, they actually observe um, alternatively the southern aura and then the northern aura and then back to Southern Aurora with Hubble over, over successive uh, Hubble orbit. And they show that the same region mapping to the, the same region in the magnetosphere uh, uh, shows that they actually oscillate in phase, uh, meaning that the emission from coming from those, those features um, well, is in phase between hemisphere, and therefore this emission uh, shouldn't be uh, connecting to the, uh, to the solar wind because it should be emitted on closed field lines. Uh, so one emission propagates along the field line and, and gets the same uh, to the conjugate part of the magnetosphere, both in the, uh, to the ionosphere, both in the north and south. Um, another recent study with uh, Juno EVS this time um, uh, showed the detection of a very bright spot that actually uh, are quasi periodic. Um, uh, that occur next to the uh, the region that I showed before, the Suar region, uh, the center of the, the polar auroral region. Um, and so, um, yeah, and so this this uh, those spots they actually um, uh, they appear at various local time, meaning that uh, those spot which initially was interpreted as as mapping to the cusp region, um, they probably are not mapping to the cusp because uh, they appear at various local time, meaning that uh, the cusp region, where, where we think the cusp is, um, is uh, well, where we think the cusp is, uh, we, we detected spots that uh, map to very various, very various region in that, that part of the, the magnetosphere. Um, okay, so as I said before, Juno has the in-situ payload to understand the particle population. So you might ask yourself, uh, do we have any, any simultaneous observation to those expanding aurora uh, with the, the in-situ instrument on Juno? Uh, the, the answer, the short answer is actually, uh, unfortunately, no, because uh, those events are pretty transient. Uh, and uh, you know, Juno hasn't flown to every part of the magnetosphere yet, uh, and, and won't be because it's a giant, uh, uh, it's a giant uh, um, a space to to uh, to explore, but just based on the spectral characteristic, you can you can uh, you can highlight what are the energy flux and the type of electron you need to explain those expanding or the the overall raindrop. You need um, energy flux on the order of ten to fifteen milliwatt per square meter, with uh, precipitating electron on the order of eighty to one hundred and sixty keV. 
so even though we haven't flown through one of these events with Juno, uh, we have flown through the, the polar aurora uh, multiple times. And this is one of the example over PJ5 in the north. So uh, this is another view of the northern aurora. Again, this, uh, this dashed line shows the kind of statistical uh, main novel that we expect. And here shows uh, only a couple of swaths of UV observation by Gino UVS. And the red trajectory shows you the, the magnetic trajectory of Gino. So at every point of Gino orbit, uh, we can map exactly where this lays, this uh, correspond on the planet. Uh, <clears throat> and so when we fly through, uh, for instance, here, an, uh, an oral uh, structure, we can actually say, we can actually um, look for what are the particle distribution using the in-situ instrument on Juno around, around that part. Uh, so over this path, uh, even though we have not had um, in-situ measurements again with, with those uh, expanding aurora, we can uh, make a histogram of uh, all the particle distribution we, we recorded over that path. And this is what is, is shown here. Uh, so this is uh, the, the histogram of the energy flux of the upward electrons, so the electrons coming from the ionosphere of, uh, well, yeah, from Jupiter uh, to the magnetosphere flying through Juno. And the, the black one is actually the downward electron, which is the electron coming from the magnetosphere into the planet. And of course, what you want to compare is the downward energy flux because you know this is downward uh, precipitating electrons that triggers aurora. Uh, and what you can see here is that, uh, and it's actually a, a very surprising uh, discovery on Juno, that most of the, in, at least in the polar polar aurora region, most of the electron population you you discover we discover is actually uh, uh, dominated by upward electron flux. The upward electron flux is always greater than the downward electron flux. So that's, that's been a big surprise of Gino. And we're still trying to understand um, what causes this. Uh, and so I highlighted here the, the range of downward energy flux that we need to explain this, uh, this um, uh, expanding aura. And as you can see, we're very far from the, the kind of a Gaussian-like distribution of downward flux. So, um, that could be uh, consistent with the fact that we don't observe very often those precipitate those um, uh, those expanding aurora. Uh, yes, and uh, that's that's um, so that's yeah that's probably one of the reasons why we don't observe um, more of these uh, uh, expanding aurora. Um, so there's different uh, possible interpretation of the mechanism that could trigger those. Oral emission. Uh, Vincent? Yeah. Okay, can I just ask a question just to make sure I understand the plot? Yeah. Um, so here you, you have, what is the, I mean, is it an histogram for at a given time or is it for a whole perigeove? Like no, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. It's a histogram for uh, roughly uh, in this trajectory from like all the, the moment where we cross the, the polar aurora region right here. Um, okay, so okay, so you mean basically it's uh, you 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 look at all the time on this trajectory, and you 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 make an histogram of how much uh, what the fraction of time basically you have this energy flux in going in the on, uh, through the space spacecraft, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, <laughs> thank you. And maybe I should I should also uh, yeah, good question. I should um, add that um, the reason why we we discover this greater upward versus downward energy flux is because the region where the electrons are actually accelerated into the planet, uh, we think this region is actually uh, uh, at lower altitude than where Juno flew. Um, and we are very excited because uh, with the extended mission, we're going to be able to fly lower and lower in altitude over the polar region. Um, uh, because I haven't shown that, but the, the orbit precession of Juno is such that we'll go to lower altitude in the northern hemisphere and higher altitude in the southern hemisphere and the southern uh, aurora region. So 
we're hoping that in the extended mission, we can fly this uh, through that uh, acceleration region and better understand why we have such a uh, uh, different distribution for the upward versus downward. Uh, so one possible interpretation would be that um, those overall emission, expanding overall emission might be caused by day side pulsed reconnection. Again, uh, IMF uh, magnetic field reconnecting with the uh, Jupiter magnetic field, um, which in some previous study were um, interpreted, were thought to be associated with polar oral UV spot and X-rays. Uh, and so when this happened, you, you should have uh, theoretically the creation of transient upward and downward field aligned currents in the magnetosphere and those field aligned currents then propagate along the magnetic field line and, and could trigger um, what we actually have observed. Um, and so in that study, Bounce et al. Uh, 2004, they actually went even further and they, they showed that this would be characterized by two adjacent UV spots or arcs along the open closed uh, boundary, which could be consistent with what we observe because, um, and if I go back quickly to that, to that plot, um, if you think that the square region, which is this, this reddish region right here, is the open closed field line boundary, uh, which is still debated, uh, all the events we observe, they actually occur in, in that, uh, at the, uh, at the um, boundary of that region. Um, okay, and so they also um, gave a, a sense of what type of brightness and morphology you would uh, you would expect. Uh, so, in the case of um, uh, an expanded magnetosphere, meaning that it's a slow a solar wind condition, uh, the those structure might be on the order of a thousand kilometer wide, um, with a typical brightness ranging from ten to three hundred uh, kilo Rayleigh of UV emissions, which is exactly what we observe actually. So it's it's pretty. Uh, uh, it's pretty good, but in the case of a compressed magnetosphere, you would expand, you would expect a much more intense emission on the order of 10 to 30 mega Rayleigh, which uh, we rarely observe on, on Jupiter. Uh, but it doesn't explain the temporal evolution of the feature that we we actually we actually have, which is the expanding over a short time as well as a range of local time, um, <clears throat> because again, some of those events map to the tail, which uh, is hard to to understand. Other possible interpretation is the uh, kelvin helmholtz uh, instability. Um, so what you have is in the in the interaction region between the well, yeah, in the magnetopause, which is the interaction region between the solar wind and the magnetosphere. You have a large flow, uh, a large shear flow between the the rotating uh, magnetosphere and the the IMF and uh, this would create what they call um, uh, kelvin Hamel's vortices. Uh, you can see here a representation using uh, a magnetospheric model that shows that the, those magnetic field lines get twisted and uh, they should be associated also with field aligned currents in that region. Um, so on Jupiter and Saturn, um, the down flank, which is uh, this region, um, is, is expected to be um, uh, kelvin Hamel's instable because if you see the the rotating magnetosphere rotates this way. So in that region, you have, um, you have a more important uh, uh, shear flow than on the other. Oh, maybe, no, sorry. I think I, I missed the down and down, down and dusk uh, regions. But um, yeah, in the down flank, this is where, yeah, sorry. I think I messed up the, the uh, down should be here and dusk should be here. So at down, when you have the rotating magnetosphere, you have, uh, this rotation, the, the, this velocity that goes against the, the velocity of the IMF coming this way, and therefore the shear velocity between the two here is is greater. Uh, but some models show that it's actually in the in the other side that uh, uh, you see a more um, important Kelvin Helmholtz uh, activities. So um, I, I should mention that the Kelvin Helmholtz is kind of the the bag that um, you know when someone don't understand something they they throw, uh, oh, it's, it's probably Kelvin Helmholtz. But there's, uh, this, it's just a difficult problem to understand. And there's very little study that shows uh, what are the morphological uh, overall signature that you expect, that you would expect from uh, Kelvin Helmholtz related field aligned currents. Uh, but it's, it's actually being worked on uh, 
there is actually, uh, it's just very difficult to reproduce with model uh, Kelvin Tremont instabilities because of uh, numerical diffusion. Uh, but there's some uh, good uh, progress that's being done right now with the uh, uh, Gamera uh, model. Okay, and uh, I think this is one of my last slides. I should mention that um, on Earth, um, there's a recent study that was presented at last AGU that um, showed that some people have discovered kind of a similarly shaped aurora on Earth. Um, so in the uh, oral study uh, that uh, Japanese, uh, uh, the Japanese team that handled the Arase satellite, they've been observing from the ground, those expanding oral emission, uh, uh, what they call pulsating aurora, and that um, they actually flew close to one of the origin, one of the source region of, of this expanding aurora with the Arase satellite. Um, and so they correlated the appearance of those pulsating aurora with uh, the, the detection of chorus waves. Chorus waves are actually uh, um, electromagnetic waves that are responsible for the scattering and loss of trapped electron, um, generally speaking, in, in magnetosphere. Um, and so they interpreted that as, as being generated by a source in the magnetosphere, um, expanding at a thousand kilometers per second in the, uh, in the equator. Um, again, I should, I should remember you that uh, we don't have any uh, in-situ measurements, simultaneous in-situ measurements with Juno. Um, Unfortunately, but uh, we are we are on the look for uh, future simultaneous measurements on the extended mission. So, uh, as you can see, this is going to be my conclusion. Overall, uh, studies are very crucial to help nailing down the mechanism driving the plasma dynamics in the Jovian magnetosphere. And so, every uh, identification of any overall feature is important because it gives you a clue as to how the magnetosphere works. Um, and so in this, uh, this, late, uh, this paper that I presented today, we discovered a new type of um, aurora, which hasn't been seen before, uh, characterized by faint orbital structure on the order of uh, 140 kilo relay of UV emission, expanding at several kilometers per second. Um, that maps to the outer magnetosphere at a distance greater than 100 RJ and a range of local time. Um, again, a uh, possible interpretation that could explain this, this feature is a day side magnetic reconnection, Kelvin Hammond's instability, or chorus waves. So, thank you for your attention, and um, I hope I didn't uh, put you to sleep with uh, a lot of magnetospheric um, uh, physics. But uh, if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer, or if you want to contact me by email later, if you have uh, uh, later questions, uh, just feel free to, to email me. Thank you. Merci Vincent. Alors moi je vais repasser en français et je vois que Benoît a levé la main, donc je vais lui laisser la parole pour poser sa question. Okay, thanks. I guess I do it in English. Um, so I have Hello. a few questions there. Um, so my first one is among the interpretations you give, did you ever think of things like theta auroras at Earth or equivalent things? Uh, theta aurora at Earth. Yeah. So the fact that uh, it could be related to the reconnection process, but depending on the IMF orientation, you can have very tricky topologies that arise from it. Um, so you think that uh, I'm not familiar with what is a theta aurora. Um, so, but I'll be happy to uh, to look this up. So I know so the thing is that if you if you have uh, some specific IMF direction, then you may reconnect. Uh, in yeah. different places of your magnetosphere. So it may be at the low latitude cusp or the high latitude cusp, things like this. And so yeah. some, some theories exist for creating uh, patches of auroras in the middle of a polar cap at the Earth, and it might be worth having a look, I guess. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I know some people do that, like Adam Master, I think he's, he's yeah. working on this. But uh, yeah, that's that's very good study. It's true that depending on the orientation of the IMF you have, uh, you can suppress uh, uh, magnetic connection or uh, enhance them, and I think it's a good, it's a good um, uh, direction to to take in the future. And my second uh, question is about uh, these uh, energy fluxes you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you uh, 
looked at the details of the distribution along the path of your spacecraft in the sense that I could imagine that you have upward and downward currents, you know, because yeah. in some places of your aura, you're going to have the upward currents and the uh, downward currents that actually close the current system back into the tail and all these things. And I suppose that uh, the distributions of your electrons may be skewed towards upward or downwards, depending on where you are within, with regards to your current system. You, you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that, that's very true. Yeah, and this is probably why we see this uh, this difference in the downward versus upward, uh, because we think that uh, we, we, well, the team hasn't really um, uh, dug too much into this, but we think that we see the difference because we're uh, we're still you know we're we're at a certain distance from the acceleration region, and therefore the the this the downward versus upward distribution is skewed towards one of those. Um, yeah. Anyway, very nice stuff. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, the Jade team is actually working on that, but they're, they're, they're pretty busy. <laughs> so uh, we're trying to push them as much as we can on this. There's so much data to, uh, to, to work with. So. Yeah, I guess so. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, I do have one then. <laughs> Go ahead. How good how good do you think your your mapping is in terms of the models? Because when you when you're trying to map uh, uh, your point A, for example, which actually ends out uh, in the solar wind, uh, mm -hmm. obviously you need you need to have a good model to try to do all these mappings and make sure you are close to the metopause and things like this. Uh, I, I just wonder. I you know I'm more Earth metosphere. Guy, uh, yeah, yeah. I just wonder how good your model is. Uh, can oh, you know? wow. <laughs> that's a very good question. It's been a challenge because you know we when we arrive at Jupiter, we use model that were derived by uh, both Voyager and Galileo, the <clears throat> the VIP four model. Uh, then all the model came uh, using constraint from the Galilean satellite, because you know when you see the uh, an oral footprint. Uh, you know that you're actually mapping to the distance. For, for instance, here you map to the exact distance of Io in the, in the magnetosphere. Uh, but it's true as you go further out in the in the magnetosphere, it becomes less and less uh, reliable. Um, and so, uh, when you map to very distance, like like those features, uh, yeah, the mapping is is not. Uh, is um, we we revised the magnet. Uh, magnetospheric uh, model, magnetic field model. Uh, now we use uh, what we call the JRM09, the Gino reference model with the ninth first orbit. Uh, we hope to update it, uh, although it doesn't depend on me, it depends on Jack Connerney, who's the MAG PI. Uh, we want to update it uh, because you know we, we have done 33 orbits so far, so it's much better than nine. And so we hope to revise it again in the future. Uh, but one of the things that has changed too, which is important in the distant magnetosphere, is the fact that the, uh, the uh, I'm gonna go back to that slide, I illustrated, right? The, uh, the current sheet, the, the strength of the current sheet, um, you know, which actually deform the magnetic field in the outer magnetosphere, as you can see here, so it's it's pretty much dipolar, uh, very close to the planet. But then, as you go further out, it becomes more and more uh, non-dipolar. Uh, and the strength of the plasma sheet current has changed since the Galileo time and the uh, the Voyager time. Um, and therefore, there's a, a new now current sheet model that you add on top of the dipolar field uh, that change also the mapping in the in the magnetosphere. But it, this hasn't been. This has to be a uh, uh, I think yeah, this one accounts for that, um, but uh, this is another source of uncertainty in the mapping. Um, so the so short the, answer is so that point, uh, the points A, B, and C in your other figure, they are using the latest available model, correct? Yeah, 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 definitely. Which is um, in crude, yeah, but I mean Jupiter is far. So, <laughs> and I should mention that I'm using magnetospheric boundary from Joy et al. Um, for a compressed and expanded magnetosphere, and, and you can see, I mean, it's just a model, and you see that it, uh, it varies uh, significantly between the two. 
So, okay, thanks. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, I have one on one of your final slides uh, with the, the discovery of those uh, uh, expanding auras uh, in the Earth atmosphere, slide 25, I think. Uh, do we have an idea what the source of those chorus waves uh, are? Uh, I'm not sure about that, to be honest. I, the, this was presented at ATU, it's not a paper, it's a, it's a talk, and there's not no more details about it. Uh, and uh, no, I, I cannot, I'm sorry, I cannot answer that question. Um, okay, no worries, we'll wait for the paper. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking if there is any other hand that is raised. But I see none, so thank you very much again, Vincent. Thank you, everybody. Okay, I think this is it. Thanks again, and uh, see you next time.